Awesome church, good morning. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of thank yous I need to go through, and that could alone take about 30 minutes. But I uh, just want to say quickly, just thank you and all glory to God for bringing me here today. Oh, it's just amazing how sovereign God is, how, um, like, today I'm going to be preaching on testimony evangelism. And just to, for me, just being up here, Joseph was telling me, it's just a testament of God's glory, of God's sovereignty and power over my life that I'm standing here today. I've got to say thank you to my amazing parents, uh, my mom and my dad, for dealing with me, the energetic, optimistic kid, just running around and just for dealing with me and, and getting, to me, getting me to where I am today. I love you guys. Also, Pastor Peter, Pastor Cara, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I love you guys too. You guys are amazing. And also to you, to you church, you guys have, you know, the big and small impacts that you guys have had in my life, Auntie Nelu, um, Christine, I've got my old kids church teacher over here from my old church, um, you know, these uncles over here, and it's just, it's just amazing. All of you guys have had a part to play in me being here, so I'm just so appreciative, so thankful that God has blessed me with such an amazing church family. So before I get started, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, that you've put me in this position. I thank you that you've anointed me, that you've filled me with your spirit to come here today and to, to preach your word, God. I pray that you will speak through me, that it won't be me, that as I partner with you right now, as your spirit is, is, is molding me and shaping me, God, I pray that you will speak through me in Jesus' name. And I pray that you will open the hearts of everyone that's here today to receive your word and that you may change their lives the way you've changed mine, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So years ago, if you told me that I would be preaching in front of you right here, I would have probably laughed in your face. Um, I was not a very good Christian back in the day. Um, and uh, it was, it's crazy because about four or five years ago, when I was about 16 or 17, I remember Pastor Peter sent a message to my mom asking if I could tag team preach for Pastor Peter. And I remember looking at that message and I was like, me? Me tag team preach? Me preach? And I know as we as Christians, we worry about living a private life but I wasn't even living a good public life. And I'm telling you that right now. I was heading down the road of worldliness, uh, fleshly desires, evil desires. I was heading down a bad road. I was falling into a pit. But I can tell you right now that God took me up and he changed my life um, in the 2020 lockdown. And just really quickly, my, my testimony, before I preach about testimony evangelism, is that from, I was born in a, brought up in a Christian household um, and just, School and teenage years just took me away. The world kind of just started to deceive me. And then in lockdown, my uh, connect group leader, my youth leader, Nathan, he's a very direct person, okay? So, and my pridefulness, my haughtiness, my pompous, it, it wasn't a good mixture. He's, <laughs> he's direct and I'm cocky and then, you know, I've, I'm always rebuttling him. And I remember we were talking about reading the Bible and he was like, he challenged me, he challenged our connect group. I, rem- I don't know if you remember, he challenged us to read John. And I was like, oh, why do I have to read the Bible? I, I read my Bible plans and I read my uh, verse, of, verse of the day. If God wants to talk to me, he doesn't need the Bible. He can talk to me whenever he wants. So I was arguing with my leader. I was not submitting, which is not good. I repented though, I repented. <laughs> and um, so in lockdown, I just started to read the word. And church, when I tell you that the word is living and the word is active today, that was the time when I truly found that in my heart. Like God revealed himself to me through that word, started to worship I went, I took the step in the natural so that God can work in the supernatural, amen? And I started to read the word and the world started, sha- word, not the word, world, the word started shaping me, molding me, and I left lockdown a different man. I, all, not, a lot of my uh, desires and evil desires was just kept going, going away and it was just like, it was lost. And I came out of that with new eyes. I came into church not because I wanted to, uh, and uh, follow my mom because my mom carried the, uh, and my dad. Uh, but I came into church because I had such a love for everyone here. And I didn't even know some of these people. And I, I just wanted to help them. And then I found, found out what my, my purpose here on earth is, which is to help young people find Jesus the way I found Jesus. And so, so it just flows on to what I'm preaching today, testimony evangelism. And now the way I like to evangelize is two ways. So Pastor Don preached on direct evangelism. And I love being direct as well. So uh, most of you might know, Brenny, um, Simone knows that I'm a very direct person. Sometimes a bit too direct, but I've repented from that. Again, <laughs> lots of repenting in the past two years. Um, so, <laughs> Amen. Good. 
And uh, so I'm very direct, but my directness comes out of a loving heart. I really don't want to see people fall off the cliff. I fell off and I'm just like, don't go there. Come here. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. And another way I like to evangelize is through sharing my testimony, sharing how I became a Christian, how God spoke to me, how God revealed himself to me, and, I, and how I can't deny God. I can't deny his existence. And you might ask me why testimonial evangelism. And I can say to you is because when someone has truly experienced something and gone through a particular event and starts to be vulnerable with, vulnerable with you and weak with you and share with you and have a deep, meaningful conversation, or as the young people say, DMC with you, that's when you start turning heads. I don't know about you guys, but the deep relationships that I have with people, the, the friendships that I have, the, um, yeah, the relationships that I have are built, the trust is built through both parties talking about life together, talking about their vulner- being vulnerable with each other, being weak with each other, sharing each other's strengths. And that's our testimony. That's our testimony. And, and when it comes to God, it's how we were, we were walking in vulnerability, walking in weakness, and God took us out of that and brought us into strength, prosperity, abundance. And that's our testimony. That's how we can share what God has done in our lives. And I love Pastor Don's sermon about a couple of months ago. It was the sermon, Tell Others. And uh, he started to outline how we could evangelize, like um, how we can share our testimony. And he described it as the acronym BMW. And uh, now I'm going to dig up this acronym and I'm going to base it on my preaching today. So basically BMW is before God, met God, and with God. So it's not a car. It is B for before God, M for met God, and W for with God. So say it with me, church. B for? M for? And W for? Awesome. So I'm going to unpack this today. And basically before God is what was your life like before encountering the presence of God? What was your behavior like? How did you go about life? How, what were your, I, I don't know, second nature desires? And how did you live your life before God? And then we go into met God. How did God become so real to you? What kind of experience did you have? How did you have, what kind of encounter did you have with God? What kind of revelation uh, did God put inside of you to really change you from who you were to who you are now? And then we have lastly, W for with God. What has God done now? How Have your behaviors, your characteristics changed, your lifestyle changed so that you do not fit in anymore with the world, but you are holy just as God is being holy. You are set apart, no longer fitting in with the flow, but you are set apart from the world that people start to question you. People are like, who is this guy? Why is this guy living like this? But that's because the Holy Spirit is in you. And I just thought that was a great way to share your testimony because people need to know your life before and after your revelation with God. As Joseph said on Friday, we went with um, Desire. I just want to honor Desire really quickly as a leader because these kids, man, these kids were scared and, 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 and just nervous to share the gospel as you would be, but they stepped out in faith. And we told about 300 people about God on Friday. 20 people. That is amazing. 300 seeds were sown into people's lives on Friday night. And oh, I'm just so proud. I was with Hans and Nelukshan, and, and it was so amazing to see all of us just team up. Just like we're partnering with the Holy Spirit, we partnered with, with one another as the body of Christ, and we went out, and we were like encouraging one, go talk to that guy, go talk to that guy. And we told him, again, we had some pretty cool encounters as well, but we had an amazing, uh, we had the luxury of having a guy called David Morton um, come and speak to us before, and this man was a missionary in Le- Lebanon or in the, in the Middle East, Jordan, Jordan for about 20 years, and he's still a missionary, and he was talking to us, and he said, what was the greatest tool? He's, he's American. I can't do American accent, but he was like, what was the greatest tool that I had when I was missionary? And uh, our, one of our uh, guys, Bodhi, <laughs> was like, the Bible, and amen to that. We have the sword of the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God, amen, but then David said that it was my testimony. It was how Jesus, it was how God, through his spirit, changed me from one person and made me into, honestly, someone else. 1 Corinthians 5, 17, we are made a new being in Christ Jesus. It is how the Spirit of God manifested in us, started molding us, sanctifying us to live a new life in Christ. And again, it's flowing on to Revelation 12, 11, my staple verse for the sermon. And they triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. 
Now, what is this verse telling us? That it's not only through the blood of the lamb, even though we all know, church, that that alone is more than enough to overtake Satan. Satan has no, nothing against the blood of the lamb. But God gives us this, this new weapon, this new uh, sword in our sheet, this new arrow in our, what is it? Arrow holder, quiver. <laughs> he gives us this new weapon to overtake Satan by the blood of the lamb, which yeah. overtakes him enough, yeah. but also through the word of our testimony. Yeah. So it's so important. Our testimony is super important. And church, I just want to encourage you that your life, your, your life has power. Your, your testimony has power wherever you are. Yeah. Each step you take when you're a Christian is anointed, is, is, is changing lives, is, 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 is causing, uh, is, is an inspiration to people around you. Because yeah. this is eternity. This is, eternal, this is an eternal impact. Now, I want to prove this to you further in Scripture, because I can talk till the cows come home about testimony. But I want to prove this through the story of Saul, who became Paul. Now, we all know Saul, uh, before he encountered uh, God in the road to Damascus, he was persecuting Christians. He was stoning. He encouraged the death of Stephen to his stoning. And if, we were, if he was here right now, Saul, we would all be in prison, stoned, killed, persecuted, everything. He hated, he was a religious man and didn't like people saying that Jesus was the son of God. Now, all right, so let's unpack the acronym BMW. So again, B for before God, M for met God, W for with God. And we're gonna unpack it through Acts chapter 22, verses one to 16. So firstly, B for before God. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to, them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. There we go. That's Paul now, before he met God. He was, he was very religious, like I said, didn't like and didn't support the, the, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the uh, living son of God. And now we move on to M, met God. Now this is a cool story. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a light from the heavens flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to them. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There we will be told that you have been, what you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by, the, by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see the scales in, Paul, in Saul's eyes came down because the light of Christ, the light of God was too blinding. For Saul, ah, oh, that just gives me goosebumps. Yeah. That's the supernatural story of how a murderer, yeah. a persecutor of the church of God has come and now we know he's written a third of the New Testament. That's the story. I know we, we always talk about, oh God, I don't know, how can, how can God forgive me when I did that and that and that. This was a murderer, a persecutor. God was like, I want that man. That man who is murdering and persecuting my children, he is my child too. I want him with me to fulfill my will, to fulfill my purpose. And this not only shows God's power over your past church, it shows God's, the magnitude of God's love and faithfulness in your life despite your past. Despite what you've gone through, despite what you've done, God has the power to make you new. 1 Corinthians 5, 17, you are made new in Christ. Yeah. It's not up there, but it's just, it's yeah. been lingering in my head. Yeah. You are being made new in Christ, yeah. just as Saul, who became Paul was. And then we go into with God. W, this is also a fun part because now we're partnering with the Holy Spirit, the God of the universe. Yeah. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know, this, to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. 
you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Now we see Paul boldly declare his mission for God. We hear clearly Paul mentioned to his people that God has chosen him, despite his past, again, to be a great influence in fulfilling God's will. You know, Paul never really just spoke about God. I mean, he did, obviously, but he didn't just talk about God, but he lived out God. Shipwrecks, stonings, prison sentences, persecution in the streets, you name it, he went through it. This is a man who was once persecuting and now being persecuted himself because of the spirit that's in him. And the Bible says that faith without works is dead. The Bible says, prove your repentance. Church, if I had a good tree over here right now, it would not bear bad fruit. Only a good tree will only bear good fruit. The Bible says, prove your repentance many times. Prove to me, prove to the great witnesses, Hebrews 12, one to two. Prove to the great witnesses, prove to those who don't know Jesus that you are a Christian saved by the blood of Christ, by grace through faith. A good tree will bear only good fruit. Now, this is one of the several times we see Paul mention his testimony to many different people. And we also see in Scripture how people reacted to Paul's change of heart. Acts chapter 9, verse 19 to 22. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow, Paul baffled. He baffled the Jews, a big B on that. He baffled the Jews and was proving that Jesus is the Messiah through what? He proved that Jesus is the Son of God through what? His change of heart through the spirit that was made manifest in him and that's sanctifying him and made him a new creation, he was proving to the Jews who once saw him murder and persecute the same people that are doing the thing he's doing right now, who's now preaching the word and confirming that Jesus is the son of God. This is now Saul turned Paul who was baffling people around him. And I like to question myself after reading that and after, after constructing my sermon, I like to ask myself my question, in my circle of influence, in my, uh, wherever I am, do I baffle people? Do people question my life? Because if they're not, then I must be doing something wrong. Because that means I'm flowing in. Then I'm more than likely flowing into the world. If they're not questioning me and how I'm going about my life, public and private, If they're not questioning questioning me, then I must be doing something wrong because God is holy and how can I be set apart and not be persecuted? How can I stand out and not have people question me? So again, I rejoice when people persecute. I love it. Oh, it makes me so happy. God righteous, not self-righteous, God righteous. (laughs) And as I was preparing this word, I just just started to think of my own BMW and... um, and do you guys ever have those moments where you just think about something you've done in your past and you just start to cringe? Oh, my goodness, church, I'm telling you right now, this whole time I've been cringing while I've been making this and just thinking about how much of a non-Christian I was, even though I was bearing the name. I was using God's name in vain. I was bearing the name, but I was living something else and ruining it for the people around me. I was cringing at myself. Oh, it's, it's funny though, it's, it's, it's actually funny how, and it's kind of cool how God just kept revealing to me how much of a fake person, a fake Christian I was. I used to act all tough and pompous and haughty, as many of you guys know, all the young adults here. Yeah, we all know. Yeah. <laughs> I was very, very pompous and haughty and just thought, it's me, myself, and I, um, I'll get to my duties um, after I finish my own duties, my selfish duties to help myself. And... I just thought I was better than everyone. I was delusional. And this is because of sport. I blame sport for this because, man, you're just taught to obviously go into the field thinking that you're going to win. You know, that's half of the thing one. And I just took that into life that I'm better than everyone. But that was not the case because God humbled me. And I'm telling you, you did humble me a lot of times. 
But this year, God revealed me how revealed to me how insecure I was. The thing that it's funny, I was thinking about this morning. The thing that actually fueled my pride was my insecurity and fear. That's what actually fueled it. Not my oh, I'm this, I'm that. But it was actually not me wanting to. I wanted to be someone who I wasn't, and it was my insecurity and pride that insecurity and fear that fueled my pride. I was insecure. I was a people pleaser. I was, self-image was big for me because I used to be a very, very big kid when I was younger. And um, it's actually pretty funny. I was pretty fat. And uh, <laughs> I used to get, I, I was pretty fat, guys. Um, and I used, to, um, I used to get bullied a lot in primary school, didn't have much friends. And I used to come home crying to my mom like, oh, I don't want to go to school because I don't have much friends. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And now it's, it's actually funny. Again, it's really funny. So you don't have to feel sorry for me. And, um, so, and, I, and then my dad got me into fitness because, you know, he wanted me to do well in sports. And obviously, I want to do well in sports. And then I took fitness into my own hands, did it myself. And self-image was so important for me, counting calories, making sure I was burning fat and stuff like that. And then it got to a very dangerous point. I became bulimic where I, um, I would... I would like justify, I'll just, I'll just eat over my calories, but I'll just go to the toilet straight away and just force myself to vomit and to force myself to get rid of the excess calories. And this happened, as Joseph knows, he, it was, he, was, he was like literally in the room next to me when that happened. He was like, what are you doing? Bro? I'm like, I was just getting rid of the calories. And he's like, bro, that's so bad. And I didn't even know that. And I was like, it's bad. Like, why am I ruining myself to make myself look good on the outside for peop- to, be, to impress people? So I was people pleasing to a point where I was putting myself down. I was ruining my own body. And I was broken, church. I again I put the fake outward. I was I had a mask on of 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 how I was this confident guy and um always um energetic and stuff, but I was actually really broken. Um and, and I that's why I don't just know brokenness, but I lived in brokenness. And that's why now I have this mission. I feel like I have this mission to go out and be direct with people. Don't go on down that path. Don't fall off that cliff I fell down. Because yeah. it hurts. It's, yeah. You're going to break your legs. You're going you're gonna to die. Yeah. Come here. Come but like I said now, God has put gentleness in me to get that person back. But I was, I was broken, church. I was very broken. I lived in brokenness. I lived in insecurity. I lived in fear. I lived in people pleasing. I lived in making sure that I was good on the outside so that I can impress people. But inside, I was dirty. I was so many strongholds, so many chains that, were, that was holding me back from achieving the greatness that God had in store for me. And He has greatness in store for you as well, church. We just need to unlock that. We need to unlock that. Therefore, again, that's why I'm so direct. But, but God kept chasing after me. He humbled me when I was only looking to my own strength and my own life to, to make my life abundant without Jesus, even though Jesus makes my life and gives me life and life in abundance. I was trying to fulfill my own fleshly desires, do my own worldly things, which only, by the way, lead to temporary happiness. Nothing in this world could ever fulfill. And I lived that life and I was not fulfilled one bit. Maybe temporarily, temporary, temporarily but I was not fulfilled long-term. Only Jesus has fulfilled me. And that's a testimony right there. And God kept chasing after me. He he saved me and brought me into a new person. Again, 1 Corinthians 5, 17, I'm a new being in Christ Jesus. This is also through internship, through the constant beating and the dying and the the cutting. Not Not physical, obviously. I'm not getting hit. Really, but just, just Pastor Peter pointing out my flaws, and I needed that. I need to be direct. I need him to be direct. I, I'm telling you now, church, I don't like people beating around the bush with me. If you have a problem with me and you start becoming bitter with me and beating around the bush with me, I don't like that. I like Pastor Peter's way. He's very direct with me. We saw it then and there, and it's done. But yeah, Pastor Peter has really tested me. Pastor Carr has really tested me. Me standing right here is a test. I've never preached before, and I've preached in desire, but I've never preached in the church before. And it's, it's not only through the spiritual growth, but it's how I could conduct myself when I go out into the real world, in my workplace, in my, in my sports field. 
plus Peter's put me through and Courtney and Eliza and myself put, put us through situations where we can grow ourselves, where we can uh, become better, better disciples of Jesus in our private and also in our, in our public lives so that other people can see the great witnesses, as the Bible says. I've been learning how not to just talk about it, but how to walk about it. Not just talk the talk, but just walk the walk. Because we can all, like the, the devil knows the Bible. The devil, has more, the devil believes that God is real. But obviously he lives a completely different life. But I need to learn that it's not just about talking about it, which is also important, confessing with your mouth, but it's also about living it. Yeah. But not through our own strength, but through the spirit and the faith that God gives us yeah. to go out and live that life. Mastering the discipline to lead a godly private life. And that's why I'll be doing every day, spending time with God, an internship uh, twice a week. It's mastering that discipline to live that good public life. And that's enough about me. Let's go back to Paul and the story. And I was just thinking about how it really magnifies how God calls us to be salt and light of the earth. And Paul stood out after his conversion, after his heart changed. Paul, it's safe to say that he stood out. Amen? He did stand out. He baffled, the Bible says. That's the word. That's the actual word in the Bible. And so what does it mean to be a light? That city built on the hilltop, the Bible says. That means refuse, refuse to associate with anything that isn't of God. When your workmates are gossiping about another colleague and uh, they're inviting you, you choose to walk away. When you're in the sports field and they go off drinking and smoking after a win, you walk the opposite direction. These little moments, these little uh, factors, these little um, events in your life builds up your testimony because that gives opportunities for people who don't know God to ask you questions, to see how is this guy living a different life to me? Yeah. And I'm this person here, anxious, depressed, because depression is big in New Zealand church and I, and I don't like it. I really, really don't like it. And I'm, I'm a big advocate for mental health. And for them to see you walking in supernatural joy that's a testimony right there. They're seeing you walk in joy. They're seeing you, nah, I don't need smoking and drinking and gossiping about people to fulfill me. Yeah. Walking in love, the love of God, walking in the joy of the Spirit, walking in the peace of the Spirit is what sets me free. And yeah, these, these are the things. It's about living that life that glorifies the Father. Being holy. Do I stand out? Do, am I holy? Am I set apart? Do I stand out at my work, at my job, sports field, at my, and when I'm doing my hobbies? Do I stand out? And again, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Bible does not lie. Once we are made new, once the Spirit is in us, we are made new. We are a different creation called to live a brand new life. And, 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 and I like the analogy as well that, you know, when you go to sleep and you're sleeping for however long you sleep for, five, ten hours, <laughs> um, and, and, and you wake up, someone turns on the light, and your eyes just get stunned. And you're like, oh, who turned on the light? That was my mom. Oh, my mom's waking me up. <laughs> and <laughs> do, we do, do I do that in my workplace, metaphorically? The light that is in me, may Jesus, may Christ be glorified in me and me in Christ Jesus. The light that's in me, am I stunning people who are constantly living in darkness? In my, in my sphere, in my uh, circle of inspiration, in my sports field, in my work, uh, where I, at the gym, wherever I am, am I stunning people with the way I live? Am I causing their eyes to go like this when they've lived in darkness so much that my light, the, not my light, the light of God is blinding them? That's what I like to ask myself. I'm, I love self-reflecting on myself. And, const, and constantly as human beings, whether we're Christian or not, we constantly see the fruit of people, whether we can trust them or not. That's a big part of being a human being. We constantly see fruit. We constantly, first impressions, it's really important, isn't it? Impressions of people, whether we can trust them, or so, uh, trust them or not. So basically, your character is so important. Your impact is so important, not just with Christians. I'm going non-Christians right now. Non-Christians judge you as well. Non-Christians are looking at your fruit as well, whether they can judge you or not. So our impact, our significance, our character is so significant and we need to make sure that we're using that impact, we're using that significance that God has given us to influence others and to glorify God. Now, for all you visual learners like me, I've got a quick analogy. So I, can I get, just get Jonathan and Tom, please? I've got this leaf blower right here. I don't even know what it is. I think it's a leaf blower. I'm bad. I'm bad with tools. What is this? It is a leaf blower, isn't it? 
Okay, come here, Jonathan, up on the stage. You come here. You go, you go down there. Yeah, and you come up here. So these, these are the two different worlds that we live in, okay? So if you can blow that over there. So pretend, okay, so pretend we're in a rainforest. I'll just hold it for one second. Pretend we're in a rainforest uh, a forest somewhere. You can't, and pretend for the sake of the analogy that the air that's coming out of this uh, leaf blower is the Holy Spirit, okay? So I'm blowing it. You can't see the air, obviously. Can you see it? Can anyone see it? But pretending we're in a forest, we can see the impact it's having on the leaves. We can see the impact it's having on the, um, the trees and the leaves on the trees and the fruits on the trees, okay? So this is, just leave it for now. This is where the Holy Spirit is. This is Jonathan and me. We're mates. We're um, going about life and the this is the dark place. We're living in our sin, and, and in our sin, we're depressed, we're sad, we're, we're anxious, we're struggling with all this stuff. But back here is the Holy Spirit. And so Jonathan finds God, and you go back. And so put on his face. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the impact the Holy Spirit is having on Jonathan. So we can see his um, hair spread here, and also his clothes getting affected. And this is me over here. I'm still living in my darkness. I'm still depressed. I'm still anxious. I'm still sad. And I'm seeing the same guy who was with me, depressed, sad, and living in the same sin I'm living in. I'm, I'm seeing him now being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, I want that. I, want, I no longer want to live in depression. I want to live in joy. I want to live in peace. So we're over here and we're like, Jesus. And then my friends come up. And that's the cycle. Then my um, circle of influence see me living in, in joy. And they come up. And then their circle of influence see them living in joy. And then they come up. That's the power of testimony, church. Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's the power of testimony. That's the power of our story. That's the, that's the power in your life. Not just my life. Not just in Paul's life. But in your life, church. We all have a story. We all have a reason for our faith. What is your hope? What is your reason for your faith? Why do you believe? I, I can say right now, I can't explain it in human words why I believe because God, is, God has just done more than what I could ever imagine. It is, it is honestly crazy. I, I wish you could see me, the new people who are here right now. I wish you could see me who I was before and who I am now. I'm, I'm just in awe and I just think about the blessings God has done in my life. But I just wanna encourage you, church, you all have a testimony. You all have a story to share with people around you. We can share it with our mouth. Amen. Go out, share it with your mouth. But we can also share it with the way we live, how we conduct ourselves, our character, how we choose through the spirit that is in us to turn away from sin, to turn away from the gossip, to turn away from that darkness, which the world is so inclined to live in. We have that choice. We have that free will. And it becomes so easy When God partners with us, when the Spirit is in us, it becomes so easy to choose Jesus because He is the only one that can bring joy. And I've lived both lives and I can testify and say that Jesus is the only one. And we have that free will and I've chosen that and God has allowed me to obey Him in that way. I'm so grateful to God. So I just wanna encourage you. We have significance and we can... We can be significant in different ways. I, I coach, um, I coach bu- uh, cricket. Um, I coach fitness as well. And I can coach them and I can be significant in them in a worldly way. And they can be the greatest cricketer ever. They can have the best body in the world. But at the end of the day, the significance that matters more is either life or death. When we die to this, the truth is we either spend eternity with God or without God. I don't care if you're the greatest rugby player right now or the greatest cricketer or the best body all I care about is when I'm coaching people is that you find Jesus in the way I live and you find Jesus in the in the way God has changed me to live in that way that's the significance we need to have that's the in the, in our sphere of influence in our circle of inspiration that's the inspiration that's the significance we need to have whether you're a teacher a therapist uh, uh, whatever you are we need to influence them in an, in, a, in an eternal way, life or death, and bring them life through the life that's in you. So there is power in your life, church. There is true power in your life. And there is potential in your impact. And I wanna encourage you, um, you church, to be a light on a hill. Not a light hidden under a bowl. 
Show off your change of heart. Show off how Jesus has brought you into new life. Because I can personally say that when I've been in a, um, a season of doubt, it's me going and asking people about their testimony. I was talking to Dan a couple of weeks, uh, a month ago about his testimony. I was talking to Seb. I, was, I speak to Slade, Joseph, everyone. And I, and I just want, it builds my faith hearing their stories. It builds my faith hearing how God, again, took them from a, a nothing, fulfilling nothing to fulfilling greatness and abundance and prosperity in Christ. And also going back and reminding myself what God has done in my life, how I could not control what God has done in my life, but he has brought me into a new place. And when I go now and meet my friends and they say stuff like, oh, I miss the old Shannon. Oh, I miss before lockdown Shannon, before you fell in love with God, bro. Oh my gosh. And oh, I can't believe the man you are today. It brings me great joy. I love it. I honestly love it. I want more of it. Keep, 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 keep persecuting me. Keep going. And I love it because they're getting blinded by the spirit that's in me. They're getting blinded by the light that is manifesting through me. And I've, had, I've actually had questions where my friends ask me, oh, like, bro, I'm, I'm living in this and I, I need to try at church one day. And that's because of God, church. It's not because of me. It is because of God. All glory to God. And hopefully they come to church one day, but I'm still praying about that and I have faith they will. Because they can see the influence that God has had in my life and and they can believe or not, that's their free will. God gives us the gift of free will and they can believe or not, but they can never, ever dispute what God has done in my life, never. I can't explain God with my human words, but I can explain him because I've experienced him, but I can show it in the way I live, in the way I carry out my testimony. There's power in that. Can I please get keys up? I just, I just wanna finish off today by, by sharing you this quote by um, well-known Charles Spurgeon. Come on the screen. It says, if you have no wish for others to be saved, then you are not saved yourself. I saw this and I got extremely challenged as I assume most of you are today as well. But firstly, before I get all the rebuttaling at the end, this is not biblical. This is not a biblical uh, saying. But what I think Charles is trying to say here is, in other words, is that if you are saved and not sharing the only person that has saved you, you have misplaced your priorities. This is Jesus, this is eternity. This is not a sickness or disease. This is eternity. This is eternal death or eternal life. I got super, super challenged by this because for before I had the revelation of God, for the 19 years, I was not sharing Jesus. I was shared a little bit, but I was not sharing Jesus and living up the life that He was calling me to live. I was so selfish. And yeah, I got, I got extremely convicted by this. And it's true in a way because... As, as a Christ follower, we hear many times in the gospel how Jesus had a compassionate heart for the lost and the poor and the needy, amen? He did, definitely did. Um, and so as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus, I also should also share that same heart of compassion for the needy, for the lost, for the poor, for those who don't have much. I also should share in that same, for those who don't have Jesus, I also should share in that same compassionate heart. And and that means, church, that whether you like it or not, evangelism and sharing the gospel is an essential part of being a Christian. A Christian that sacrifices his or her self-dignity, his or her fear to go out and to look after someone else, to die to oneself, to die to one's insecurities and fear, and to go out and help someone else who needs Jesus. That's the greatest honor and greatest commission that we have as Christians to share the word. And I wanna do a quick survey. I want you guys to be completely honest with me, okay? If we had the cure to cancer, who would go out and show it? I know I would. If we had the cure to cancer right now, who would go out and tell the world? Guys, how much more should we go preach Jesus? The, the cure to everything, the cure to death. How much more should we go preach Jesus? The cure to our cancer, amen? The cure to our depression, the cure to our anxiety, the cure to every stronghold and chain that is holding us and deceiving us and leading us down the road to death, to an eternity without the Father. How much more should we go out and preach the Word, preach Jesus to the lost? If we're willing to preach about the cure to cancer, why not the cure to death? Why not the cure to cancer and everything else, which is Jesus? That's the greatest honor. I, I feel it is. I don't know about you guys, but I feel it's the greatest honor to go and tell people about Jesus. Testimony 
is super important. It's so important, church. But when I say this, please don't go out and fake it. This is like hand sanitizer Christians. You know, 99.9%. We give 99.9% to God and 0.1% we leave to ourselves. I was like that. But we're called to surrender it all. Die to oneself so we can live for Christ. We're not called to go fake our relationship with God. This is in fact a mockery to God. It's like our church mission statement, authentic faith and relevant expression. It's gonna come on the screen right now. Through, through, well, by the way, faith is a gift from God. Through the authentic faith that God has given us, we will relevantly express it to people around. Not through our strength, amen? Not through our strength. We're, we're not called, God, faith is a gift from God and God gives us that authentic faith. And through that authentic faith, we will go out into the world, go out into our, into our a circle of influence and express Jesus, share our testimony. Let's be children and servants of God who are authentic in our walk. Each step we take is anointed. Each step we take has the potential to sow a seed of power in people's lives. Each step, church, every step you take from now on when you leave the church, each step you take, just know it's anointed. No one has the power to sow a seed of God, seed of power of heaven in people's lives. God has given us this task to walk with Him, to keep that testimony and once again be the light in a dark world, a city built on a hill, as Matthew says. And so like Paul, like myself, and all of us, we all have a testimony. We all have a story to tell. You tell me which man and woman of God just said, Jesus is my Lord and Savior and did nothing about it. No one, you can't name me one, a man or woman of God that did nothing about it in the scripture. We all have a metaphorical BMW. So let's show it off, church. Come on, let's show off. Let's do donuts in the car park. Let's bring up that BMW and let's go out and show it off to the world. Our before God, our met God, and our with God. Let's go out and show it off. How much more? There is power in your testimony and in your life. I know that I've been bought with the blood of Jesus and so have you. And I also know that my testimony has the power over Satan. Revelation 12, 11. It makes the gates of hell tremble. It makes the devil shake in fear, knowing that Jesus has done this to my life. Our testimony has the power in our families, in our workplaces, in our relationships, in our sport, sporting fields, wherever we play. That's the power. May that be it, that we overcome Satan and all his schemes not only through the blood of Jesus, which is strong enough, but through our God-given testimony. So Lord, I just pray, Father, that we will not leave this place the same as we entered it, God, that when we walk out of this church right now, Father God, I pray that we will know that each step we take as your disciples, as your followers, is a step of anointing, is a step of power in this will, God. I pray that you will touch our hearts. I pray that you will sanctify us. I pray that you will give us more faith, extraordinary faith, God, to go out and live a life of significance, to share our testimony with the world.